This tutorial is on genetic engineering. The first aim is describe what is meant by a genetically modified organism or a GMO, then explain how to create a GMO, and then finally evaluate the pros and cons of genetically modified organisms or genetic engineering. And I'm going to start off today by exposing you to this image here. At first glance, it looks like something a year seven student could produce in an art lesson. However, as you shall soon discover, there's more to this image than meets the eye. But to really appreciate this image in all its glory, we're going to have to understand a few things first. Firstly, we have to tackle the issue of what exactly is a genetically modified organism. To understand this, I'm going to talk about computer programming. Now, there are many different languages of computer programming out there, and different computer companies or console companies use a specific language that works with their console. So, for example, if you took an Xbox game and tried to play it inside a PlayStation, it just wouldn't work because the PlayStation wouldn't understand the language. However, the sequence of bases that make up a DNA molecule can be understood by every single living organism. Whether you're a bacteria, a fungi, a plant, an animal, they all understand the language of DNA. What this means is that we could take the DNA out of one organism, or part of the DNA out of one organism, and put it into another organism, and that organism's body will be able to understand that language. And as a result, they could respond to that language. Now, if you remember, I said that genes, which are sections of DNA, code for specific proteins. So if you took the DNA for, of a specific gene out of one organism and put it into another, then that organism could manufacture that protein. So a GMO is an organism that contains genes from more than one organism. They are sometimes referred to as transgenic organisms. So just to give you a quick demonstration of how this works, I'm going to look at something that was really conducted, a genuine experiment, where they took uh, genes from a rabbit and inserted them into the genome of a mosquito. Or it could have been a fruit fly. Genome is a word that refers to all the genes present in one living organism. So they took a gene from the rabbit and inserted it into the genome of the mosquito. But more specifically, if you look at the rabbit, they took a gene that codes for leg production in the rabbit. So I'm going to extract that gene now. And I'm going to replicate it and put it into different parts of the mosquito's body. So one in the eye, one over here, one, let's say, over here. So remember, this is the gene for leg production in rabbits. What effect do you think it will have on this mosquito? The effect was really, really interesting. You might think that this mosquito would start growing rabbit legs wherever the gene was inserted, but this wasn't the case. Instead, it developed mosquito legs wherever the gene was inserted. This illustrates a really interesting point about genetic engineering and DNA in itself. All genes do are provide instructions like a blueprint of how to make certain structures. They do not provide the organism with the raw materials to make those structures. So a mosquito's body doesn't have the ingredients to make skin and fur, but it does have the ingredients to make exoskeleton material called chitin. So the mosquito's cellular machinery will basically read the gene for leg production and make a mosquito leg because it cannot make a rabbit's leg. So now I think we've learnt enough to understand the beauty behind this picture. Firstly, this is not a canvas, but a Petri dish filled with agar jelly. And this isn't felt tip, and it's not paint. It's actually bacteria which fluoresces different colours when under UV light. But where did this bacteria get this ability from? Certain jellyfish contain a protein called green fluorescent protein. So obviously they also contain a gene which expresses that protein. Now as you now know that DNA is a universal code that can be read and understood by any other organism, if we, if we extract that gene that codes for a fluorescent protein and put it into the genome of another organism, then that organism will also express that protein. So different fluorescent protein genes were used to basically insert into different bacteria colonies. And as the colonies reproduced and as the bacteria divided and grew in population, they all expressed this protein, this fluorescent protein, and then you could see it on the agar under UV. So I hope you can now appreciate how sophisticated this picture, which seems very simple at first, really is. So that is what is meant by a genetically modified organism, an organism that contains genes from more than one organism. So let's now learn how to actually make a genetically modified organism. Now diabetes, for example, is a problem or condition which is on the rise. As a result, we need lots of insulin and we need it made very quickly. 
We used to get insulin historically from other animals, even including fish sperm. But larger animals reproduce slowly and therefore the insulin they make, well, the quantity is limited. However, if we can put the insulin gene into an organism that reproduces very quickly, like bacteria, then we can make vast quantities of insulin. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do. So step one is to isolate, isolate's an important word, the desired gene using enzymes. So here's a section of DNA from a human genome, and here you can see the gene for insulin. What we literally need to do now is cut that gene out of this DNA. To do this, we use special enzymes called restriction enzymes. Enzymes, remember, have an active site which is specific to a certain shape. This means they will target and they will basically bond to specific regions of DNA and therefore can be very precise when cutting out a desired gene. So our restriction enzyme will basically come along and it'll make a snip where it needs to, cut here, here and here, and we can then remove the gene. Now you may notice that the cut is jagged, it's not exactly straight. We call these overhanging regions sticky ends. And without them, the gene will not be able to bond or latch on to the DNA in the other organism. So we've isolated the desired gene for insulin, human insulin, using enzymes, restriction enzymes. So now we have to find a way to put that gene inside the genome of another organism. So let's look at our bacteria. Bacteria contain two forms of DNA. They contain one large central loop known as circular DNA. It's just one huge series of chromosomes joined end to end to make a large circle of DNA. And then we have tiny, more manageable loops called plasmids. Because of their convenient size, genetic engineers like using plasmids. So we need to insert our recently cut gene into this plasmid. So I'm just gonna zoom into this plasmid so you can see the DNA sequence. So this DNA strand represents this small section here. Now, once again, I use restriction enzymes to make a cut at the appropriate point. So now the DNA can be separated. And notice how it leaves sticky ends again. This will now, hopefully you can see, this will now make it possible for our cut piece of DNA, the gene for insulin, to insert itself very easily. So step two is use enzymes, restriction enzymes again, to cut another organism's DNA or chromosome. Now all we have to do is insert our gene. So here's the gene for insulin. I'm going to insert it here so it matches exactly. And then I use another enzyme called ligase enzymes. And unlike the uh, restriction enzymes which cut, the ligase enzyme pastes. So the ligase enzyme will come along and basically make sure that the DNA fragment is bonded and securely locked in to that segment of DNA. But all you have to say is insert the useful gene. So now this bacteria contains a gene which allows it to express the protein that makes human insulin. And because bacteria replicate very rapidly, in very short spaces of time, we can produce lots of bacteria that can make human insulin. So if you ever have to describe the process of how you make a genetically modified organism, you would just say, isolate the desired gene using enzymes, use enzymes to cut another organism's DNA, insert the useful gene. Simple three mark answer. And that is how you explain how to create a genetically modified organism. So here are some uses, very useful uses of genetic engineering or gene technology. Uh, for example, you can now produce sheep, which in their milk can produce medicinal drugs, which can help fight disease. In goats, we've inserted the spider silk making gene into their udders so they can produce spider silk in their milk. Yes, believe it or not, spider goats actually exist. And this isn't just madness, there is a reason for this. Spider silk is one of the strongest materials, natural fibres on this planet. It's incredibly useful. It, for example, it can be used to make very strong medical sutures. Suture is the kind of surgical thread which we uh, sew up organs with or incisions with. Spiders, however, are very difficult to farm because they end up killing each other, but goats don't. So we found a very convenient way to manufacture spider silk without killing the amazing organisms that produce it. More commonly though, genetically uh, modified crops exist and crops which can now, for example, resist viruses or insect pests. Some crops have been inserted with the Bt gene. Bt gene expresses a toxic chemical which kills insect pests but is harmless to humans. Also, herbicides. Imagine if you're a farmer and you need to get rid of the weeds but without harming your own crops. Other 
Without gene technology, you'd actually have to go around to every individual weed in the field and apply the herbicide directly. This would take ages. So imagine you've now got herbicide resistant crops. You could actually spray your entire field with herbicide and ensure that only the weeds die because your crops are now resistant to it. A massive time saver and time means a lot of money in farming. Also, don't forget gene therapy. For example, cystic fibrosis sufferers can literally inhale genes using something called a nebulizer. They literally, it looks a bit like a Ventolin spray like asthmatics use, and they will basically inhale the genes into their lungs, and those genes will be inserted into their cells. And temporarily, while they last, the normal gene will basically suppress or cover for the faulty gene that exists inside the cell. So these are just four examples of the many uh, range of benefits that gene technology can offer humanity. However, like with anything else in science, there's always a good side and a bad side. So let's make sure we are aware of both sides of the argument. And by the way, this could be a very obvious six marker at the end of a biology paper. So let's look at the cons first, because we've already looked at some of the uses. Firstly, if all the crops, for example, are the same, they're genetically engineered, we reduce biodiversity. For example, maybe these crops stop attracting certain pests or certain animals which feed off them. Lowering biodiversity has a whole range of knock-on effects. For example, many medicines are found in living organisms, living plants and, and animals. If there are less of them around, then we basically reduce our range of potential medicinal resources. Secondly, many worry that GMOs aren't actually safe, and some worry that they may develop allergies to them. But you have to take this with a pinch of salt, because uh, it's not like people don't develop allergies to normal food anyway. The long-term effects, as it's a relatively new technology, are unknown, so that can always worry people. But relatively speaking, these two aren't particularly strong arguments. This, however, is a strong argument. Superweeds may develop. So imagine you've got herbicide-resistant crops. We know that certain crops can fertilize others through wind pollination or through insect pollination. So if you took the pollen from a herbicide resistant crop and let's say insect or wind pollinated and fertilized a uh, weed, it would develop that ability to resist the herbicide. In other words, we could have very tough super weeds that are very difficult to kill. And finally, and in my opinion, probably the most important thing to consider, Research and development for gene technology is expensive, so naturally you'd want uh, the companies to protect their investment. They can basically patent their product. What this means is they put a copyright on their product because they've invested so much time in it. They basically legally can say, well, for this amount of time, let's say 10 years or 20 years, no one else can copy our product and make money off a similar product. So once a company is in this position, which in some ways is fair enough, they can monopolize the market. That means they are the only people in that market, the only company selling that product, and therefore they can charge whatever they like. And let's say if this gene technology is going to help poorer countries, they could completely exploit these poor countries, as has happened in the past. Not necessarily with just gene technology, but other products as well. But let's also look at the benefits. You've already seen many on the other slide. Um, but here are a few others. Um, because we can basically make crops more hardy, more resistant to harsher climates and weather patterns, maybe they can now grow in uh, soils which have less nutrient content, we can increase crop yield. Yield is a word for how many we'll produce. So increasing crop yields basically means we'll produce many, many more crops than usual. And therefore feed many, many more hungry mouths in our planet. We can also improve the nutritional content of rice. This is massively important. Some nutrient-poor soils, uh, particularly in very hot, dry, developing countries, provide very poor conditions for nutritious crop growth. We can use gene technology to insert genes that code for specific nutrients. For example, commonly used is the gene for beta-carotene, which we basically put into rice plants to make golden rice. Beta-carotene is very important for our eyesight. There are places in this world where children are going blind because of a lack of beta-carotene. But rice is a staple food in many parts of the world. In other words, it forms a large part of the diet. So if we can insert this beta-carotene gene into golden rice, then it can produce beta-carotene and prevent that problem or lower the chances of that problem taking hold. Finally, it's also important to note that GM crops are already used and they're used successfully. In fact, many foods you may already buy could be a product of GM technology.
You don't necessarily need to learn all these arguments, but learn three from each side, and you should be fine for any six marker on the pros and cons of gene technology. And now for just a quick word on the Human Genome Project. This was a collaboration of many scientists to map the location of every gene in the human genome and determine their function. So you know that inside a cell you have a nucleus, inside nucleus you have chromosomes, you have 46 chromosomes to be precise. But these chromosomes are arranged in pairs, so you have identical pairs of chromosomes. So really what we need to do is find out how many genes are found on half those chromosomes, 23, because the other 23 are essentially repeats. So here you can see some chromosomes and I've marked out the position of genes. So we're just trying to find the position of all the genes, all the pieces of information that code for proteins on our chromosomes. That's around 25,000 genes to locate. And the reason why this was a global project, well, let me put it this way. The DNA found in one human nucleus contains enough information to fill a one million page encyclopedia. That's 40 times bigger than the largest encyclopedia we have. Collaboration was necessary to speed up the process. So project planning started in 1984, 1990 they started carrying out the project and by 2003 they found the location of every gene. Now we're just trying to work out the function of every gene. So why go through the hassle of mapping out every gene? Well once again we have pros and we have cons. Firstly, it become much easier to predict and prevent diseases. If doctors knew which genes were linked to which diseases, they could recommend the perfect lifestyle, the perfect diet to reduce the chances of getting that disease. And if the worst comes to worst, we could make sure we provide early treatment because the disease is already on the doctor's radar. If we understand how every disease develops on a genetic level, we can develop new and better medicines. Some diseases such as Alzheimer's are very hard to diagnose until the person has died. But if we can link genes to specific diseases, then it's much easier to diagnose a disease accurately. Also, having an understanding of what genes do exactly will give us improved forensic science. For example, we may be able to tell from DNA alone what the suspect looks like, hair colour, skin colour. Identification would be a lot easier. However, there are other things to consider. It could lead to increased stress. For example, if you knew you were susceptible to disease, and let's say it was a, a brain-related disease, every time you had a headache, you might start to stress unnecessarily. The next one is a genuine word you can use. It's called genism, and that's the idea that anyone with genetic disease might be placed under pressure not to have children, and also may experience discrimination by employers and insurers. For example, if an employer knew you were predisposed to a genetic disease, they may choose not to hire you. Also, life insurance costs may go through the roof if insurers know that you're very likely to contract a certain condition, which affects your lifespan. So for an easy six marks, just remember two or three of these arguments on both sides. And that is how you evaluate the pros and cons of genetically modified organisms.